So we've got David Chering for us today, who's one of the, well, he's our Deputy Director in Systems and Policy um, from the University of Cambridge. So I'll hand over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Karis, and, and thanks to everyone uh, for joining. As, as uh, Karis was reminding me, this is the last of uh, this academic year's um, series of UK CCSRC uh, seminars, um, which has, has delivered, as I was learning, a, a huge number of, of, uh, of such events. Um, and so I think um, this is a great way of, of ending it. Um, uh, particularly with words that we don't <laughs> often hear, maybe hear enough with regard to uh, uh, CCS, not just shielding, but nurturing and, and empowering uh, CCS. Um, so um, Sarah Mander uh, is um, going to be uh, presenting today. Um, Sarah, I was, as I was learning, is actually it was originally a chemical engineer in, in their uh, first, uh, first degree. Uh, but then her, got her PhD at the School of Management at Manchester, and since since then she's been at the um, the, the Tyndall Center. Um, she spent um, I'm not sure how long at, at the Bayes uh, Select Committee as as a as a fellow, but but I think the, the most fascinating experience. Uh, and as part of uh, our uh, UK CCS Research Center, uh, Sarah, uh, along with Claire Goff, leads. I think we call it uh, CB1, which is, is kind of the work on um, uh, sort of the social license to operate of, of carbon capture and storage. So it's a great pleasure um, to welcome Sarah. Thank you very much, David. And well, good afternoon, everyone from a, from a very sunny Manchester. So yeah, I'm um, very happy to, to be here today to be able to talk about the work that my colleague Claire Goff and I have been doing, um, funded, I'm very grateful for funding from the UK CCS Research Centre. And the, the, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is energy transitions in the industrial clusters, shielding, nurturing and empowering CCS. So um, this work is, is part of David's work package as part of the CC SRC, um, and it has uh, two objectives. So along with my colleague Claire Goff, we were focusing on the UK's industrial clusters. And the first piece of work that we were doing was looking at the conditions necessary for establishing a social license to operate for CCS and the future implications for industry and BECS. And then the second strand of work that I'm gonna talk about this afternoon was exploring the role of the industrial clusters in enabling CCS CCUS by applying um, concepts from sustainability tra tra transitions management, in particular, the idea of a, a protective space. And so to do this work, we, um, we did case studies of the clusters and we mixed, uh, we did interviews with key stakeholders and, and documentary analysis. And we're very grateful for the time of the 11 stakeholders that we spoke to who were either working within the clusters or working at a national scale. And the insights from these interviews were then kind of triangulated with, with documentary data. And in particular, we also found that because this work, uh, we did this work during lockdown, so we couldn't travel and, and visit the clusters and interview people in person like we might otherwise have done. But actually one of the, the kind of the benefits of, of lockdown was this um, UK CCSRC seminar series and the fact that it's brought so many, it's brought the, the kind of the clusters to your your home office and other researchers to your home office. And we're really grateful to all the work that Karis and others have done um, in order to, to kind of make this seminar series happen. So what I'm going to talk through today is I'll start off with a bit of background, then I'll spend a bit of time explaining the um, concepts of sort of innovation and transition management that we uh, used for this research before going on to talk about these three ideas of shielding, nurturing and empowering CCS. So just um, some background that, that people are maybe familiar with, but uh, UK industry emits 110 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent uh, roughly per year, and 68% of those emissions are from large point sources, many but not all of which are concentrated in industrial clusters. And I, I think this uh, diagram from the CCC is particularly uh, useful because so the, the heat map that kind of clearly shows emissions hotspots located in the clusters 
but also reminds us that um, significant industrial emissions also come from outside those clusters. Uh, so UK industry directly employs around 2.6 million people. Um, and I was, I was very struck by the presentation from Matt from Repowering the Black Country that highlighted that potentially over 90% of those, those people are employed outside of the coastal clusters. And overall UK industry contributes uh, maybe 170 billion to the UK economy. Now, when we look at the, the kind of the, the targets for industrial decarbonisation, uh, emissions must fall by two thirds by 2035 and 90% by 2050, which in effect is a, you know, is a massive transformation in our industrial systems of industrial production. Four clusters must have CCS infrastructure by 2030 with one net zero cluster by, by 2040. So that's the, the scale of the challenge that's been, that's been set to us. Now the work that um, I'm going to talk about partly sets, uh, uh, partly uses a, looks back kind of is partly historical because it, it looks at, at kind of the history of the clusters. It also reflects on the clusters at the moment and on, on going forward. And I think that this is particularly important because you know this is a actually this when we look at the the scale of of income to the country from industry, the number of people are, that are employed, and we think that CCS is, is one of the only options for decarbonizing many industries. You know, this industrial transformation is, is a transformation that cannot fail. Um, and so increasingly, CCS is talked about for cross-sector decarbonization, which on the one hand um, implies, makes the case, implies a bigger role for CCS, but on the other hand, as CCS is talked up in these contexts, it potentially closes off other options. So we need to make sure that, that kind of that CCS succeeds. So I'm now going to just give a bit of background about, um, I suppose, theories of sustainability transitions. And for this work, uh, Claire and I used one particular framework, which is called the, the multi-level perspective. And I, at the top of the slides, I've, I've, I've got some of the references and they, you can also find those at the slides that will be online, um, the kind of the other scholars, the other work in this area that we've that we've drawn on. So when we think about a transition, so a transition takes place due to the interactions between three levels. We've got the landscape, the regime, and, and the niche. And so I'll start off with the, the regime, which is the existing, um, called it the socio-technical system or the, the, the existing ways of doing something. And it, it's called a, a socio-technical system because it, it reminds us that, that technologies, that engineering, um, doesn't sit in a it sits in a vacuum. It sits within an institutional context, a social context, an environmental context, and our technologies both shape that context and are shaped by that context. So this might include so we have technology and infrastructure, but they are, are kind of governed and managed by by rules, by institutions. They rely on business models, business practices, and so you can't separate out the social from the technical. And these social technical regimes and um, these existing ways of doing something, they're very stable. Um, they're very hard to change because they are locked in by these broader structures in which they sit. And um, that stability makes it hard, makes it hard for them to be changed or to change them. And one time in which these very stable systems are Kind of open to change or are disrupted so they can change is by changes in the landscape. So the landscape is the ex external factors that sit outside of your existing way of doing things and place pressure on it requiring them to change and they are factors that are outside the control of the institutions within your, within your regime. So uh, when we think of the, um, say the electricity network, we're shifting from a, a coal dominated system to a renewable dominated system and that change has been driven by changes in the landscape, by, by climate change, by aging infrastructure, by concerns about energy security. So these external pressures kind of disrupted the system and are driving
registered and used in EOR applications. And so most of that carbon is captured from, from industrial sources where, uh, which is cheap, you know, high purity CO2 direct emissions, which are cheaper to capture. The CO2 can be transported using an existing, um, existing transport infrastructure. And the fact that um, CO2 has a market is, is kind of is supporting that process as well. So that offers a, a passive shielding space for, for CO2, for CCS, which isn't, wasn't present in the UK for, for power CCS. However, when we think about deploying CCS in industrial clusters, we can see that that offers passive shielding compared to power CCS. And here in this image, I'm just illustrating some of the, you know, some of the reasons why um, deploying CCS in industrial clusters makes a lot of sense. Um, we've got direct emissions often of, of high purity CO2, which reduces your capture costs. There's a, a diverse expertise and, and skilled workforce. Um, many of our industrial clusters are, have are located um, relatively close to offshore storage. And in the case of um, Acorn and, and the Northwest, there's the potential for infrastructure reuse. Um, uh, there's the feeder 10 pipeline in Scotland, there's, there's onshore hydrogen pipelines in Teesside. So we can see already that, that these are existing spaces which are, you know, are favourable um, for deploying CCS. We then move on to ideas of active shielding and, and active shielding arises from specific interventions and they can be um, different types of interventions. So for example, um, funding from national governments. So when um, you can see through the, the uh, CCS competitions, for example, that national government was providing active shielding for, for power CCS in the form of those, um, in the form of that funding. Um, when we look at say the UK CCSRC, that's been another space which has been created in order to advance and, and further research and development and networking around CCS. So it, it's another example of a active shielding, kind of the, the creation of a space um, where to kind of advance CCS. But the shield, active shielding doesn't have to happen um, through funding necessarily. And certainly we saw in the, in the late 2000s uh, with uh, work of Yorkshire Forward um, and also in, in Teesside where devolved, um, regional devolved administrations were key to driving forward industrial decarbonisation, particularly in the absence of a policy in this area from national governments. And so how the, how the active shielding occurred in these cases was through, um, in the case of Yorkshire and Humber, uh, creating a, you know, a vision mapping out what a, a storage network could look like for the region. Um, in Teesside, CCS was written into kind of local industrial strategy. And so it was providing through these actions, local and regional government were, were kind of working to further industrial CCS. Um, post 2017, when we have new strategies and funding from national government, again, we have Kind of active shielding from national government focused on industrial CCS. So now moving on to talk about um, nurturing and empowerment and I'm going to talk about these two together because um, I think I should have pointed out that these kind of nurturing and empowerment and shielding they aren't sequential pro processes they're kind of they're interlinked and, and actions in one area and one kind of area also further actions in in others. And so key to nurturing is, is the building of stakeholder networks, the creation and, and sharing of visions and roadmaps, and then using these roadmaps to provide a strategic frame, framework for learning to enable deployment. And with empowering, um, so yeah, to enable CCS to emerge from a protected space to wide scale deployment, stakeholders must influence and change the wider regime. And to do this, we need diverse stakeholder networks with influence and resources. Um, we need narratives that explain, that make clear how regulations, business models and institutions need to change. And these narratives need to, to present CCS as the solution to um, 
current kind of social political agendas to kind of policy challenges that governments and others are looking to solve. And just to illustrate how these are how these are interconnected, so you, you'll you need to build your stakeholder network and amongst your stakeholders, you need diverse stakeholders, they have to have influence and they, they need to have resources to be able to kind of yeah, further the, the ambitions of your network. Together, an, a network needs to kind of build visions and roadmaps to provide that structured, that opportunities for structured learning, but it's through that learning and through that vision that you develop those narratives that help you to to understand firstly, but then also to explain how regulations, business models, institutions, and so on need to change to allow CCS to flourish and then to have those align with current social political agendas. So moving on to talk about uh, stakeholder networks. So our stakeholder networks, they must be strong, coordinated and able to work together. And th this doesn't happen by accident, um, particularly when we think of our industrial clusters, you may have organizations. So in order to, to kind of for industrial decarbonization, those organizations must work together with a common, common purpose around industrial decarbonization. However, those same organizations um, in other senses may be competing for they may be industrial competitors, they may be competing for the same skilled employees, the same funding, the same resources. So actually within your stakeholder network, you have to find that balance. You have to kind of be able to bring people um, who maybe are not used to working together to work together for this common cause around industrial decarbonization. And here again, we can see that regional governments have been key to maintaining a focus on industrial CCS and, and actually providing the forum, providing the mechanism for, for um, different companies to work together. And I think that's most obvious in Teesside. And when we're thinking about this, we can compare um, Teesside, which has had a very uh, stable, um, stable local governance regime compared to uh, Yorkshire and Humber, where, where CCS was being driven forward by the regional development agencies and with the, abo the abolition of the, the regional development agencies in um, 2012. So Yorkshire and Humber lost that kind of coordination on, on CCS and it became harder uh, for CCS in the region to kind of to advance and to be furthered in the absence of that central coordination. And going forward, we've seen now that um, in many of the industrial clusters, local government actors, for example, the Humber Leth is, is now involved in the in zero carbon Humber, the Greater Manchester, uh, Cheshire and, and Liverpool city regions are involved in the, the Northwest cluster. So we're seeing that, um, that these uh, kind of regional stakeholders who are particularly important because they have, in a sense, they have that neutrality, they have that mandate um, to advance their particular region so that they're well able to play that kind of coordination and negotiation role, encouraging your other industrial actors to, to, to work together. And so, yeah, so, so post 2017, um, the government cluster funding has been central to bringing these stakeholders together, including kind of regional and devolved governments, but importantly to rebuild the trust of, of companies who's very much, you know, trusting government and, and their desire to develop CCS had been shattered by the cancellation of the, the two funding competitions. So as well as um, your kind of local government's stakeholders, um, cluster networks must include stakeholders from across the whole CCS chain. Um, so including kind of capture, transport and storage, and they have to include all aspects of the regime as well. So, so it's not uh, because CCS sits in this, this broader social system, all aspects of that social system need, rep need to be represented within your, your, your cluster, your cluster network. So you, you don't you just need your emitters and, and people involved in CCS, you need those working in terms of local supply chains, in terms of business models, in finance, 
connection to, to kind of educators and those who bring the skills and, and also collections in to your, your local population. Those stakeholders need to be able to commit time and resources and you need stakeholders who work at, at different scales because you need to be able to connect the, the local to the regional to the national and then to the international and beyond. And those stakeholders, you need an element of institutional learning, so to a power and influence. Um, because you know, when you're thinking of the empowerment, you need uh, influential stakeholders to be uh, looking to influence governments, looking and kind of, yeah, using that influence and that power in order to be able to, to further uh, to kind of nurture and empower CCS. So visions and, and roadmaps are, are essential in this. And here I've just got a, an image of some of the different uh, sort of roadmaps and, and images that have been prepared by the, the different clusters. Because at the end of the day, we need visions and roadmaps because achieving deployment requires a clear understanding of, of not only the endpoint, but also the route, you know, the route that we're going to use to get there. And this is particularly important when um, you're, you're developing, you know, you're developing a technology under technology uncertainty, and there's different endpoints and routes that you can choose from. And visions and roadmaps, they, particularly when you bring your stakeholders together in order to develop them together. Um, in, in social sciences, we often talk about visions being performative in the sense that that the act of creating that vision, that, that the act of working together in order to create that roadmap is your first step in making it real. And that um, without bringing, that it's far easier that people kind of buy into the common goal when they've been involved in developing it because it, it's their goal too. And so these visions and roadmaps are kind of really important to ensure that that kind of, that it's a, it's a joint endpoint and, and we're all working together towards that, that common goal. However, when, so I've, I've talked a lot about the, the kind of the clusters themselves, but we, we know that emissions from all industry must be cut by 90% by 2050. And that uh, according to the presentation by Repowering the Black Country, 56% of those emissions are from outside the industrial clusters. And so, even at this stage, we have to be asking ourselves, how will industrial decarbonisation be rolled out beyond the clusters? And I've got two images here. So the, the one with the arrows is a, an interpretation of a, a Bayes roadmap kind of thing. So with um, near term actions out to 2030 and then far less certainty out to, to 2050. And we, we can already see the kind of 2030 onwards, kind of a note of caution that comes in, CCUS networks expanded to remaining clusters and beyond, depending on technical development. And similarly, kind of the, the role of hydrogen depends on, on system change. And so I think there's a, there's a danger in, in when we think about decarbonisation beyond the clusters in perhaps the the kind of vagueness of these, these roadmaps at the moment. I've also included there an image from a report last year by Element Energy for the CCC, and it's showing CCS infrastructure. And although it says that this, it's, it's for illustrative purposes only. So it's, you know, it's an illustration of one, one particular possible future that has, uh, has cluster points around the Peak District, around Medway and around South Wales. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing in the middle of the uh, middle of England. And so if we think back to the idea that that kind of visions and roadmaps are, are kind of their communication tools, they're, they're performative, they're kind of the first point of, of making um, making the future happen. I wonder if there's there's danger in images like this that don't um, that, that kind of had this big gap in the center of England. And I think that's why it's particularly crucial that say repowering the black country are one of the clusters uh, receiving funding from the government to kind of to remind us that actually you know to be the voice for industrial decarbonization outside the clusters because going forward whilst the clusters offer great spaces 
for initially deploying it, 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 can't, it can't end with the clusters. So when we, we talk about kind of learning beyond technology demonstration, so technology dis demonstration is important, but it's only part of the story. So we need to understand um, all the interactions between our new technology um, CCS and the wider social systems in which it sits. And so whilst on the one hand, um, the cancellation of, of competitions, for example, has set deployment of CCS back there's that it still brought us a kind of a, a legacy of of knowledge about um different aspects of the deployment so we have you know we have engineering studies we have reservoir assessments we have an understanding of um of kind of the operational aspects and and then also through kind of funded work for example we've got work on, on business models and so from a, an understanding from a learning perspective, I think we're, we're really well placed to understand, we have that kind of that foundation of learning. And one of the things that, that within clusters, what, what's, what we have to be able to do is we have to explain, explain to, to those with power how the regime must change in order to accommodate CCS. Um, and I think one thing you notice in lots of the engagement with Bayes, for example, lots of the reports, stakeholders, from the clusters have been really, really proactive in participating in those processes. Um, you know, despite the, the setbacks and the kind of the, the blow that the, the cancellation of the competitions kind of caused the industry to suffer, um, the people as stakeholders have been very proactive in making that argument and explaining exactly what has to happen in order for CCS, um, CCS to be deployed. So, Key as well is the idea that that um, within your narratives, within your stories, you have to you have to provide solutions to policy challenges. And the clusters both have common themes and to the stories that they you know their narratives about the cluster. But there's also um, differentiated narratives between them. So I mean, some common themes are around kind of safeguarding and um, an economic development, safeguarding jobs and economic development within the clusters. They're around net zero, around um, cross-sector the, the decarbonisation that could be realised. Um, hydrogen is an element of that than in each of the clusters. However, the clusters also have um, differentiated narratives which kind of bring out the unique benefits of, of particular clusters. So in Teesside, it may be the the kind of the, the very long-standing relationship, working relationship between different organisations, and the the kind of the compactness of the cluster in the the northwest. Um, so there's the potential for infrastructure reuse. Uh, it's a, a cluster very much hinged on the hydrogen economy. Um, Humberside brings us in possibility for ne negative emissions through Drax in Scotland. There's um, the ideas around the just transition, around the reuse of infrastructure. Uh, South Wales has uh, potential for decarbonising iron and steel. So e each of the clusters has, whilst telling a, a common story around the importance of CCS, they can also tell stories about their own, their own cluster. And those narratives, CCS narratives, must tell a clear story of how CCS can provide solutions to policy challenges. Um, and so, you know, some of those policy challenges may, for example, be around the just transition. They may be around um, decarbonising heat and, and transport as, as well as industry. And um, I think stories and narratives are particularly important. So we, we can have we can have um, we can have graphs, we can have charts, actually. But a lot of for a lot of people, they that information, that kind of that detail comes to life around, comes to life through the stories that are told around that, you know, that technical detail. And through telling a, a good story, you can, you know, we all hold different values and you can tell a story that can appeal to the different values that, that people hold. So now I'm just going to, to kind of wrap up and, and conclude and hopefully leave plenty of time for discussion. So 
definitely industrial CCS has benefited from the sort of the um, support of regional governments prior to receiving attention from national government. And that has been essential in leaving the UK in, in a good place in order to deploy industrial CCS. I think um, in these initial stages, in, in the same way that um, from a technical perspective, clusters offer the opportunity for kind of a, a, a hub trans, uh, transport and storage model from, a, from an innovation and from a social perspective, the cluster approach also kind of mirrors that in that it offers the opportunity for stakeholders to be able to kind of create a, a protective space to deploy CCS and to kind of shield and nurture and empower it. And that in that respect, stakeholders have a crucial role in order to, to shape the conditions to help CCS thrive because technology, um, technology is shaped by the social systems around it. However, we need to think beyond the clusters because I, I think um, history tells us that uh, transitions can leave people behind. And you know, the UK is still bearing a lot of the, the economic challenges as a result of, of previous transitions in that regard. So actually we need to be, in order to have a, a just net zero transition, we actually need widespread deployment of CCS beyond the clusters and that we need to start thinking about that now. And that requires a collective vision for decarbonized industry in the, in the UK as a whole. I think um, at the moment, some of the clusters um, see being a cluster as, as bringing economic benefit, the potential for economic benefits to them as a cluster. And we have to ask ourselves at whose expense will those economic benefits be? Um, and so in order to, to ensure that the economic benefits of industrial decarbonisation um, are spread across the country and to try and minimise losers as well as having winners, we need a, a collective vision for, for decarbonised industry in the UK as a whole. And that this vision has to be co-designed by stakeholders and these stakeholders need to be inside and out of the cluster. Um, and as well as inside and outside of the CCS regime. So yeah, that's the uh, end of, of kind of the, the presentation and I'm very much looking forward to questions. Thank you. Great, that's, that's brilliant, Sarah. Um, uh, so questions, comments? I have a list of things to ask, ask about the rest. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe we could start by asking, you know, whether, whether anything surprised you, you know, going into this, obviously you have a lot of knowledge of, of the overall system. Were, were you, you know, particularly with the focus on clusters and is, is there anything that you maybe were a bit surprised about going in? I think, I wasn't, I suppose the, the importance of um, the regional and local governments surprised me in a sense. I think when, when you look back, um, you can see, for example, in the Northwest cluster was an early one that was looked at in terms of the potential in the East Irish Sea uh, for transport and storage. And so early assessments were done, I think, um, James Watt did one of those, the IEA did one of them. And so, you know, as far back, I think as 2005, 2004, 2005, um, the potential for CCS was being explored in the Northwest, for example. But even though that early, that early work was done, there was no, um, there, there wasn't anyone to kind of coordinate that, to kind of drive it and, and take it forward. Whereas um, uh, on Teesside, that was being talked about at the same time, but because you had that kind of regional and local government interest, uh, that was taken forward. Yeah, whereas in, in Yorkshire and Humber, just the, the kind of the, the act of getting rid of the regional development agencies very much, um, very much kind of set industrial CCS in that region, region back. And I, I think I was, yeah, I was surprised at how central 
be, because you you maybe often think of industry you know ccs being uh, you know it's it's about industry it's about utilities it's about um networks it's kind of it's not necessarily about local government and i was i was surprised at how crucial that the role of local and regional governments turned out to be yeah no that's great i, I was i was actually always impressed by yorkshire forward and and their uh, kind of vision i mean in fact arguably the whole a lot of what's following now is is kind of uh, <laughs> what I think Steve Brown and others at Yorkshire Forward had, had imagined yep. uh, 15 years ago or something. Uh, well, we have a few um, questions. Um, I'm not sure how you say it, but um, Saik Hari Santoso, do you want to ask your question about social restrictions? Hello. Hello, yeah. yes. Uh, the CCS may be like a dirty thing. Maybe some people uh, see it uh, as waste. So how about the social restriction? Is that any yelling to stop the project or that any input for the forward, the progress? So this is can be useful rather than uh make a waste and more pollution you know what i mean so i uh, just so make sure I've, I've understood you correctly you're asking if kind of public perceptions and could um could be a barrier to the deployment of ccs yeah this is, could be more pollution more dirty more black you know this is the carbon uh, make the land more uh, cannot use for agriculture. So why you use CCUS rather than hydrogen or uh, electrification? Because this is people show this is dirty and black maybe. I, th I think I mean potentially. So in in the past when CCS was I think more commonly talked about in terms of coal power and fossil fuel generation than um, perhaps many NGOs and others may be less, may, may not have been supportive of, of CCS because of its associations with the fossil fuel industry. I think with kind of the position we are now when CCS in the UK is, is going to be initially started with industry, that actually that, um, that potentially that has the, the opportunity to, to, to address some of those reservations that, that people may have. I, th I think also when you've got the, I think that the thing about the clusters is that clusters are very place-based, um, you know, they, and the involve, with the involvement of, um, local and regional governments uh, in in driving in driving forward i think that that change that changes the conversation around ccs and it it kind of it, it remove it it kind of it makes that potentially makes that conversation more around your kind of your your local benefits that come from preserving industry in a particular place the kind of local benefits that could come from from building skills and I, th I think it, it changes it changes the conversation in a way that could be positive for CCS. So that's not to say that there aren't kind of aspects of CCS that um, that may raise that will still raise concern for people, and that those taking it forward need to actually kind of understand different perspectives and, and unpack those reasons through kind of dialogue with with different with local people and with different groups. Okay, okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Sarah. So uh, I guess John has uh, one or two or three questions. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, sorry. Um, yes, so I think you said that a benefit in a cluster has to be at the expense of somewhere else. And, uh, and sort of related to that, that you want to have net zero everywhere, which is obviously true, but but how how easy is it to 
you know, essentially overcome geography and geology and, and give people access to CCS if they're in, not in a cluster or, you know, depending on, on their location. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're, I suppose what I'm saying is that we need to think about the somewhere else's now, actually. Yeah. And, yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, geography and location can't necessarily be overcome, but we still, we still have kind of high concentrations of industry in particular, in particular places. And, and actually, if we are talking about, um, if we're talking about trying to, if, if we're saying that decarbonized industry can only be within a cluster or only be close to a hub, then the conversation needs to, to be had, A, about whether there's other approaches to decarbonized industry in those particular places. I mean, mm -hmm. so could you, for example, co-locate, how can you co-locate industries together potentially where the CO2 from one could become the, the feedstock for another it might be one way of, of doing it or can you can you are there other ways of transporting your CO2 but I think what what we can't do is is not be having that conversation I mean I you know I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from the perspective of no, I mean yeah. you could do what you could do you just might not yeah. be able to do it I mean you might not be able to do it but then you have to be saying okay how can we manage how can we manage industry and places away from those industries and towards towards something else um, yes. rather than it not being thought about and not happening yeah. and then yeah with the kind of consequences of that yeah and then the other one was just an observation that the rotterdam port authority is just <laughs> my local government let's just take the rotterdam port authority and uh, make make the same sort of organization anywhere you want ccs done and it'll happen Great, great for transport and storage infrastructure. Yeah, thanks, John. I think they even had a former prime minister leading their, uh, <laughs> yeah, leading I mean, their it's good, like, which is a different, different level, maybe. It, but, it, is, um, it just, just, it just makes you sick with jealousy, basically. Um, so I'm not sure we would want a former prime minister leading. Anyhow, um, um, Brian, you, you're, <laughs> you're next. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. That was really interesting. And I was struck particularly about what you said about landscapes and, and thought it'd be helpful if, if I could understand some of how that might play out. I mean, I, I see that in the UK, we've got these tremendous advantages of, you know, large amounts of offshore storage for CO2 in multiple locations and oil and gas companies that are experienced and can help us with developing all of that. Uh, but I sat in a really excellent um, webinar hosted by Business Green yesterday. It was looking at what's going on in the East Coast cluster and talking about the tremendous opportunities in that region to develop the offshore storage and the onshore projects and so on. Um, and it was all really positive, but what you could see was some questions coming through from the audience which were quite negative in tone and really seemed to be um, looking at not wanting some aspects of these projects to be developed simply because the oil and gas companies were involved and they shouldn't benefit from this somehow. And so I was wondering in what you said on landscape, how do you see this would all play out? Because if I look at it in a simple minded way, I would kind of look at what you said about landscape and say, well, the external factors affecting the oil and gas companies are we've got to get to net zero. So moving into CCS would be a good thing. But then you see that opposing opinion that these industries in some people's minds shouldn't be allowed to continue and allow us to deliver that benefit to the UK. So I'm a little confused how, how that sort of landscape Thing would really work in our practical UK context. Thank you. Yeah, no, oh, that's, that's really interesting, actually, and I, I'm not sure how well I'm going to, to answer that. I mean, I think in some, some respects, it, I, I wonder how the other actions of those oil and gas companies play out to influence that. So for example, are you still exploring for oil and gas on the one hand 
in other places, whilst at the same time looking to benefit from managing offshore storage, offshore storage in the UK. And, and actually, I mean, similar, similarly to our politicians, you know, we want people, we want people to act um, as though they're taking the problem seriously. And so, you know, on, on the one hand, you could then ask those same oil and gas companies, how seriously are you taking this problem if you're still trying to get oil out of the ground, gas out of the ground, as opposed to, to be whole, whole scale, you know, making that transition. So I, I think that's possibly one of the, yeah, I, I can see that that's a, I can see and that's a barrier. And I, I think it's because, yeah, potentially companies are not acting, are not kind of, not taking the climate emergency seriously in some areas of their operation as in others. And, um, but, at the end of the day, if we if we want to decarbonize our industries, you know, CO, CCS is the only route for doing that in many cases, and the CO2 has to go somewhere and someone has to manage those those resources. And in a sense, that's that's the, the bottom line. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's 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 interesting. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, fascinating question. Um, uh, and uh, Irina has a, a question. Oh, thanks, Sarah. That was a really interesting overview of CCS in the UK. And I was just wondering when you mentioned, of course, that CCS technology still needs a little bit of nurturing to achieve market feasibility and all this. Have you, do you have any thoughts about how the progress of CCS compares to other parts of the world um, in terms of competitive advantages or disadvantages as, as we try to roll this out further? Ooh, um, I, I think, and I think, I mean, David could probably answer this, this question better than I can. So maybe if I have a, if I have a, an attempt at it and then David or others could, could, could step in and, and kind of can have a bit more of a, a discussion. I, I think in the UK, we have, we have an opportunity to do something in terms of the offshore storage that actually other countries haven't necessarily done and that could be somewhere that um that the uk could develop a competitive advantage but but i think as you if you if you just look at the you know a lot of the big companies involved are um they are multinational companies so Perhaps it's the it's the companies themselves that are developing the competitive advantage rather than the countries. I don't know, David. What do? How would you? I mean, well, I mean, on on the tech side, I mean, there isn't a huge, you know, a, you know, a Rodney Allum and, and sort of Net Power is a is a classic example where where the UK um, supported the the technology, but then they needed. To go to to the U.S. and and get you know kind of large Japanese uh, funding to really scale scale it up. So on on the pure tech side, I'm not sure necessarily that there are huge that there there are big UK advantages. But but um, but clearly, as you're saying, Sarah, I do think on the on the offshore storage um, side, the the, the um, you know particularly given the um, you know supply chains and expertise that, that we have in the, in the North Sea. I think that does give the UK a big uh, a big advantage. Thanks, David. If anybody else wants to chime in? Um, I, I I also maybe had one. Anybody if anybody else has questions, I, I'll. Defer to them, but I did have one other question. Fire away. Um, and and that, that you mentioned kind of vision documents, I think, and 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 <laughs> roadmaps and so on. And uh, I don't know if they're a bugbear of mine, but I, I do always get slightly, you know, I, th I think you said they're kind of the kind of the first step along the road. And I suppose the question is, sometimes they 
they can feel diversionary. So rather than doing something, we'll <laughs> um, design a roadmap. I, so I wonder where you sort of come down on that or where you, know, where, you, where you think that it can be useful and where it might potentially be less useful. I think that they are useful when they are, when they're the start of something that, that people are committing time and resources to. So where you bring, you know, different, so, so say you're, say you're a, a cluster by bringing different organizations together to collectively um, envisage where you want that cluster to be and then to, to kind of map out the steps, the steps back in order to get there, that, that kind of, that it, if that's part of a genuine, genuine process of change. So by, by doing that collectively, you're developing a common vision that kind of, whilst that everyone can buy into and has ownership over a certain extent, to a certain extent. And then if those organizations are then actually committed to, to kind of putting resources and time to act, to kind of, to take the steps along that roadmap, then that's, so that, yeah, that they have to be the start of a process rather than the end in, the, in themselves. If, if, if actually developing the roadmap, you know, you, you have to be committed to taking the roadmap forward. I think often maybe you develop a roadmap and that's, that's the end of your process. You've done your roadmap and then it, it kind of, you know, it remains like a, a good, a nice visual on a website because you, you haven't thought about how that, that you can take it forward. But where it's the start of something, then I think that particularly for something like a, you know, a big transformative change, you have to have that collective vision of where you, you know, that, of where you want to be, that kind of positive vision of the future that you've, in order to kind of start off on that journey, that you won't, you won't be able to make that journey unless you have a collective understanding of, of where you're going to go. Um, that, that's brilliant, Sarah, and I think you take us exactly to, <laughs> to, to three o'clock. Um, so uh, mostly I think it's just left to me to, to, to thank you. Um, I guess uh, Karis will know when, when we start up again. I know we have our UK CCS conference coming up in what are we, September 7th and 8th. Yeah, um, that's exactly right, David, well remembered. I, I quickly, quickly looked through my, my, uh, my diary, but I, I, as, and, and I guess the, um, the seminars will start up again shortly thereafter or something? Is that yeah, right? that's right. So our first seminars will be scheduled for the first week of October. Um, here's when we're due to start the seminar series up again. Um, so we'll be sending out an email to everybody um, who's registered for the series probably next week, um, provide links to any of the resources and also um, let you know Yes, how to sign up for our newsletter and all of this kind of um, interesting um, things as well. Um, and we communicate everything through our newsletters as well. So it gives everyone the opportunity to sign up for kind of future seminars, um, but also for our um, conference. We're really excited for our conference. It's the 7th and 8th of um, 7th and 8th of September. And we've um, we've got a different software platform that we'll be using, which seems to have a very good networking um, side to it as well. So we're really hoping, even though it's virtual still, we'll be able to facilitate a bit more networking between people, um, which would be great to see more of you in September. Um, so yeah, a big thank you to Sarah today. That was great. It was really interesting. I really, I really enjoyed kind of hearing about the work that you've been doing on the clusters and that. So thank you for that, Sarah. Um, and thank you, David, for sharing. Um, and yeah, we hope to see all of you very soon and have a very good summer. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.